It's Labor Day weekend. Actually, more specifically, Labor Day Sunday. Yes. Tomorrow being Labor Day on the Monday itself, having many people have the day off to be able to just say, hey, thank you for being a <clears throat> good worker and employee. But it's traditionally beyond that, it's kind of like the traditional end of summer. Memorial Day is like the beginning, so to speak. Yeah, we're into the summer season. It's getting warm. The sun angle's high. And then we come to Labor Day, it's kind of like it comes to an end because we realize, you know, getting to that fall routine. You've got fall sports, obviously, been go are now going. You've got school going. You know, even as a church, you know, we begin to get into our fall schedule that's going to be starting up here the 14th or mid a midweek, you know, sort of ministry and discipleship. And, and so, you know, you got this. So you realize it's kind of like we, we enter the end of summer. You know, it's the, the end of the schedules that we had during the summer, the end of vacations, it's the end of, you know, the, the long, hot days. You start to get cooler, longer nights. You know, it's, it's kind of like it comes to an end. We just ended just the other day, uh, this, this past week, we ended our Thursday evening uh, summer gatherings with our youth and young adults, and we just had a conclusion there when we had meals with them. It was just in a Bible study. It was just awesome, a really great ending. But it does, it comes to an end, and that's what that, that's what Labor Day is about. It's the end to summer, if you will. We you know, ending things is very popular. It's a big subject that we like to talk about, like end times. When is the end going to come? When is Jesus going to return? It's something that we know Jesus is coming. We know he's coming back because the signs are everywhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> but we don't know when, though. But it's a topic people love to talk about. And it's highly talked about. Matter of fact, if you go and you do a little search engine search, you know, you type in a keyword, type in end times. Keep it kind of general, just end times. At lifeway.com, our Christian book site, you get over 300 titles. A bigger site, which is christianbook.com, you get over 7,700 titles about the end times. But if you go to Amazon... You get over 100,000 titles. Specifically, something about the end times. Obviously, it's various different kinds of media, but regardless, that's a lot. End times is something that people like to talk about. Something that we like to discuss, and we like to debate, and we like to just think, it's common, it's common. We want to know when Jesus is going to return. But you know what? It's also a big moneymaker. People sell a lot of books, a lot of studies. Some, some authors are constantly spitting out books because of something, some big event occurs and they go and they spit out another book. Oh, how this fits in the timeline. End times is a big, big conversation, big topic. Well, the Apostle John, the elder, as we've been looking at his letters, he identifies himself as the elder. He has spoken on this topic as well as we will find in 1 John chapter 2. Beginning of verse 18, if you have your Bibles, please do turn to there. Verse 18, it says, Dear children, this is the last hour. <laughs> End times, guys. As we talk about, we'll get into that in more details. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. He's talking end time stuff here. Okay. Verse 19. They went out from us, that is the Antichrist, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you, talking to the church, have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Do not, I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. And because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what He promised us, eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from Him 
remains in you. And you don't need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Yes, may God add his blessing to this reading of his section of scripture here. Let's take a look at it. Instead of taking a verse by, you know, looking at it chunk by chunk, I just want to read it all together. It's really about end times and how we can work to be prepared so that when Jesus comes, we're ready. First off, let's look at the very beginning. He talks about last hour. That's verse 18. He said, this is the last hour. 60 minutes to go, guys. Put your timers on. That's all we got. <laughs> it could mean last day. It could mean last chapter, last scene. It's all the same idea. The end is near when Christ returns. We know that John and the apostles and the other apostles, they also expected Jesus to return soon. We just don't know when. But they were expecting it soon. John is writing here the last hour. We're about 2,000, we're not quite, but we're getting closer to 2,000 years when John wrote this and penned it down in his original autograph that the Holy Spirit inspired him to write. And yet, we're, John wrote last hour, and here we are, 2000, almost 2,000 years later, and we're still in that same hour. You see, the last day, the last hour, the last chapter, what it refers to is the messianic era, if you will. Um, some would take it from maybe from Jesus' birth. Some would say no, Jesus' baptism. Some would say Jesus' ascension. I would say from his baptism because that's, I just kind of picked that because that's when he announced his ministry as the Messiah. He came to be known, so to speak. I mean, prior to that, John had pointed him out um, based upon what we can understand. But regardless, John the Baptist, that is. So Jesus, to take it from his, his uh, baptism when he was publicly announced and God the Father said, this is my son who I am well pleased. You know, listen to him. What? not. And so we got the, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all present there at baptism when he came up out of the water. All the way to when Jesus will return. That, that's, that's the era. That's the, the last hour. All the other stuff is was preceded. This, this is the final day. This is the messianic period. This is where you get the Antichrists. They didn't have an Antichrist beforehand. <laughs> They had false messiahs, but the Antichrist is trying to teach us, teach people and lead people away from Christ. The Antichrist, okay? And this is how we know that they were in the last days. Um, that's uh, the core sign is the Antichrist. There is one core evil Antichrist who is a false messiah who is set up and empowered by the devil himself. We see this laid out in the book of Revelation. So you can go ahead and look in, in, into those and you can see the, how Satan sets up basically a false trinity or tries to, in many ways, to deceive as many as possible. So he too, we know that the Antichrist is coming and he has yet to appear. He could be present in this world right now, but we don't know. So that speculation may not even be here yet. However, there are many Antichrists. Again, verse 18, who are active in the world and have been active in the world and continue to be and will be in the future as well. They're the ones who intentionally speak against the true Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God. They speak against Him and they try to point you either maybe to themselves or to someone else. They kind of look at themselves as a Messiah-like figure or something like that. They get too big ahead and they have gained a following. And so we do have those. But there's also Antichrist. They just speak against Him. They deny who He is. They potentially speak against them. Now, these false teachers, these false Christs, antichrists, whatever you want to call them, who speak lies, they, they actually, John says, they came out from us. That means the church. They came out from the church. <laughs> yeah, they, they came out of the church, and they don't belong to the church. They're not a part of us, and that's why they laughed, because they weren't a part of them. But still, regardless, is that he was still here. He was in the church. And they, they, they will still sometimes be in the church and come out of it. How, how can this possibly be? How could it be that an antichrist could come out of the church? Well, let's see two different, different ways. I mean, you could see some more, but two core ones I would see. One is that the person actually goes in with destructive intent. In other words, they come to damage the church, to destroy the church, to harm the church, to tear it down. 
And many people have obviously done that in different ways, but we're talking about one who, uh, someone who's empowered by Satan, if you will, and enters the church for the purpose of harming it. They become a, a part of it, if you will. They appear to be, to be a loyal, faithful Christian, if you will. They try to be a good friend. They try to win loyalties, to win, gain trust from people. But essentially, they've entered in a recruiting mission, a recruiting mission to gain followers, to lead them away from the true gospel of Jesus Christ, to cause confusion and to cause deception to lead them astray, and so that they kind of wander from the faith, or they go away from the faith, maybe, or maybe they're not even quite a believer in Jesus Christ yet, and to lead them so that they don't become a believer. Another kind of situation could be someone who is a spiritual seeker. I say a spiritual seeker because that's a big word today. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm spiritual. Because sometimes people have spiritual advisors. Okay, that can be good, that can be weird too. It just it kind of depends on what that means. And that's why it's kind of like a general spiritual, what does that mean, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a general type of word, it's not really specific. So a spiritual seeker may be one who could come in, and they're interested in God. They want to know more about Him, and they want to learn about this Jesus. Who is He? Because they've heard different things, and they want to understand Him. And so they're very inquisitive, and they come. People can actually get excited about Him, because they, they're attending services, they're attending some studies, and they're inquiring about things, they're asking lots of questions. Oh, this is good, this is good, this is good, and all this stuff. But they also continue outside of the church to, to do some other things, too. They, they're mixing in things about other religions, because they're very spiritual. They don't want to be intolerant. They want to close their door. They think, well, I think there's good in all kinds of walks of, of <clears throat> excuse me, of, of faith. And they mix in lies. <clears throat> and they develop, a, what ends up doing is they develop kind of like a hybrid religious idea. Which is shared and it confuses others and it causes problems and even some conflict as well. Begin, they begin to espouse some of these ideas in the church. You see, Satan's goal in working through either someone may know it or someone, you know, they're bent on destruction in the church or they're just, they're just kind of seeking, but they're really not surrendering. Satan's goal in working through them directly or indirectly is to draw people away from the message of Jesus Christ, from the true message. He doesn't want people to go to Jesus to be saved. He wants to keep people away from him. So he's got this antichrist and you know, others that are pointing people in other directions, false directions and showing false ways and false messages and false teaching. Looks to keep them away from Christ. And what happens is, is that, as John said, they left from us. They're in the church, but then they left. Well, they left because as the church, as we proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ, the full truth of Jesus Christ, and continue to maintain the true message of Jesus Christ, maintain the message of His Scriptures, and we attain to living according to those Scriptures. And we stand and we know the truth, and when we know that, as we'll talk a little bit here just a little bit in just a couple minutes, as we proclaim that truth, truth is like light, it exposes lies. So what will happen is that eventually you get to a point where they will flee. That person who came bent on trying to cause harm in the church will flee. That person who came in who's being spiritual will get to a point where they're going to flee. They're going to go out to some find some other place where they're more accepted or more received or something at that moment. But the goal is to draw others with them. And many times when they do, they do take some with them because they have deceived some. It's not good. They want to get away from... From the truth, they want to get away from the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth. And so they will do that, and they will flee. As John said, they came out from us. They did not belong to us. That's why they left. Because they don't come to repentance. They don't surrender. And that's when they become exposed. Some it, takes, some it doesn't take that long. Some it's taken a long time. It doesn't matter. We have to realize that they are there. And so what can happen as a church, sometimes what we can do is we can be like, okay, do we have any of Satan's plants in the church? You know, the moles. You know, the work from the inside, the traitor, the leak, whatever you want to call them. Do we have that in the church? And you focus on that. No, don't do that. Don't focus on that. Don't focus on who could be the bad. No, that is not to be our focus. John is just telling the church, be aware that this is going to happen. The Antichrist is there. The, the Antichrist is coming. we got Antichrist who are there. They came out from the church. In other words, they're going to be there. You know they're going to be there, but don't focus on that. Don't study that. Be aware of it. Instead, focus on what we have. And this is where he goes and reminds us, beginning of verse 20, that he 
tells us what we have as a church. And that is, number one, we have an anointing. Verse 20. Look at that verse there. You see, you need to highlight it and circle it. We have an anointing by the Holy One. You know, in humble repentance of sin, as you and I, as we do this, we humble ourselves. Repent of the sin and ask and seek the Father's forgiveness. And we place our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What do we do? We receive the Holy Spirit. We're born again, right? We have to be born of the Spirit. And what else do we do? We become a new creation in Christ, right? Amen. I mean, that's an awesome, incredible new identity that we have in Jesus Christ. We now belong to Him. God, the Holy Spirit, He is our anointing because He sets us apart. That's what anointing means. When David was anointed, he was set apart, he was consecrated, he was set apart for God's, for God's purpose. And so the high priest was always, had the oil poured in his head and so forth. But we have, as I said, we have that anointing within us from the Holy One, that is the Holy Spirit. He comes, he sets us apart from the world. We're no longer part of the world, we're no longer part of the kingdom of darkness. We've now been transferred and given citizenship in the kingdom of light, the kingdom of heaven. We belong to God. The Holy Spirit is, is now dwelling inside of us. God, the Holy Spirit, is dwelling in me, in you as believers in Jesus Christ. And He is not going away. Amen? Yes. Amen to that. Because we are anointed by God. It's not going away. No one's going to come and steal that from you. We are anointed. Do not forget that. We've been set apart for God. He does not leave us nor abandon us. We also, in verse 20, tells us that we know the truth. Yeah, and we do know the truth. Now, we're learning more and more of that truth, yes. But the truth simply what? We know who God is. Now, do I totally understand God and all His character and nature and who He is? No. But I'm learning. I'm growing. But I know that He is God. He is Adonai Elohim. Yahweh He's the mighty one, the everlasting Father, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the triune God. He is sovereign over all. He is righteous and holy and merciful and faithful and full of grace, full of compassion. But He's also judge. He is righteous and holy. So I know the truth about God, and I also know the truth about our world. And that our world is the exact opposite of God. And I know about the evil prince who rules it. And that is Satan himself, and I know where he's going. I know the struggles and the sorrows in our world. I know the pain that is in our world, but I know the evil that is in our world because I know about myself. We know about ourselves. We understand that we are the sinners. The evil that is in our world comes out of the hearts of people. Out of the sinners. All of us are sinners. So we know that. So I know that. So therefore I go before God in repentance but in trembling because I realize that I have offended Almighty God. I have rejected Almighty God and I have said, nah, I'm going to do my thing. I don't really care about you. And then I come to realize that and that's a scary thing. So God is to be feared. I know that. I know the truth. And because we know the truth, we are also, something else we have is that we can recognize a lie. Verses 21 to 23. The ultimate lie is, what? That Jesus is not the Christ. That's like the ultimate lie for, for in, in our messianic world today, is that Jesus isn't the Christ. That's why there's the Antichrist going to be coming. That's why there's Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist is here. Anyone, John says, who denies, actually God says it through John, anyone who denies Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, as Savior, as Lord, as the anointed one of God, as being the, the Son of God, the Son of Man, being Redeemer, you name it. Anyone who denies Him, that person is a liar. You say, well, those are, those are tough words. Yes, they are, but they're true words. Jesus is the Christ. He is Savior and He is Lord. Whether I believe this or not, whether you believe this or not, whether half of Sudberg believes this or not, whether half of the state of Pennsylvania believes this or not, whether half of the, half of the nation 
of the United States believes this or not, or half of North America, or half of the world believes that Jesus is the, the Christ, that He is the Savior, that He is Lord. Whether they believe it or not does not change the reality of who He is. Seven plus billion people could tell me that my name is Steve. But I know that my name is not Steve. It's Terry. I know that. I understand that. And they can sit there and say, seven billion plus say, it's Steve, it's Steve, it's Steve. And I'm like, no, it's not. You can call me what you want, but the reality is, is that my name is Terry. That is my name. And the reality is that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Christ. He is Savior. There is no changing that reality, depending on, regardless of how many people believe or don't believe. We can recognize a lie because anyone who denies Christ, Jesus as the Christ, we recognize that's a lie. They're lying because when they do that, they also deny the Father in heaven. They deny the Father too. Because in John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said very clearly, I and the Father are one. The Son and the Father are one. You've got the Holy Spirit in there too, but they are one. So in other words, if you don't have Jesus... You don't have the Father in heaven. You don't have Him. If you don't have Him, you don't have the Holy Spirit, do you? Nope. Which means if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you cannot have life. You cannot be born again. And if you cannot be born again, guess what? You do not have salvation. So if you deny Jesus, guess what? There's no salvation. There's no life. And because we know the truth, we recognize the lie. The Antichrist, the end times, what is the battle? Is to get all of the attention off of Jesus and to focus somewhere else. And to get it onto the false Messiah who will be coming, that is the Antichrist. But we know the truth. And when we hear that, and the more we understand the truth, the more we get to have that truth become clearer and clearer and clearer and focus in our lives. We fix our thoughts on Jesus. We fix our, our, you know, our eyes on Jesus. We fix our hearts on His Word and His truth. The more we do that, the more we understand it. Guess what? The lies can become more and more obvious and picked up. We're going to recognize the lie of the enemy. We're going to recognize the lie of the Antichrist. So what do we do there? What do we do to, to keep it so that we do recognize and, and, and don't fall for it or get deceived or begin to question? What do we do? We continue, verses 24 to 27. We listen to God. You see, God has spoken. God is speaking and God will speak. He does speak. He does that through the Holy Spirit. He's always constantly speaking. Yes, we have His Word, but He's also speaking to us, speaking to, about His Word. He's speaking into our hearts, His love and His desire. He's speaking and sustaining us. He's speaking and creating. But what we have ultimately heard from Him is that as the truth of Jesus Christ, this must remain in us, the truth that Jesus is the Lord, He is the Christ, and He is Messiah. We do not give up. We share it, we believe it, and we live it. So we need to keep listening to God. Keep listening for God's voice and understand and recognize that voice. For salvation and life are only found in Him. With take, away, take away God, you don't have salvation. You do not have life. Life is only found through faith in Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to listen to Him. God is still speaking. And we need to then remain in Him. Remain in Him with confidence. Yes, confidence. That's the whole thing. We can be confident. We can be bold and courageous. Why? Because He's with us. But we need to remain in Him as well. Because He is with us. See, verse 26, He says here, the people will try to lead us astray. So John's writing, I'm writing to you because people are going to lead you astray. I'm going to do, you know, they're going to try. They're going to be doing this. By all kinds of various means, they're going to try to lead you astray, wander down some sort of path that's just going to hurt you, it's going to cause all kinds of destruction and damage. Attempts have been made, they're being made, and they will continue to be made to deceive us from the truth. This is something that we have to understand as a reality. It's going to continue to happen. But the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy One, is not going away. As we said before, it's not going away. We should not be allowing anyone to teach us differently. Verse 27. It doesn't mean that you don't need a teacher. It doesn't mean that you don't learn anything from another person. We have the Holy Spirit. He's our teacher, yes, but we also have each other where the Holy Spirit speaks through. God speaks through other people. He's not saying that at all. What he's saying is you don't need to have anyone to teach you anything differently. We know that Jesus is the Savior. We do not need to be taught some new secret insight. 
some new revelation that someone has gotten. Oh, God spoke to me. You need to come and listen. Or knowledge that some sort of secret knowledge that will lead you to a new level of spirituality. It's like, oh, you're down here, but you know what? With this information, this knowledge, you could rise to this level. There's nothing in the Bible about that stuff. That's baloney. Resist the secrecy. Resist the cleverness. And said, embrace the simple truth that even a child can understand. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Ooh, that's pretty cool. Or he could do another one. That was actually from Romans 10, 9. Do another one. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, and that whosoever believes in him shall not, what? Perish, but have everlasting life. Peter was asked the same question, what should we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, all of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. That was in Acts chapter 2. And you get John 3.16 in there as I quoted as well. It's a simple truth. But it's incredibly profound. But it's a simple proof. Through truth, it's, it's not complex. We need to hold on to that and remain in Him. To fix our thoughts and our eyes and our heart upon Jesus and His Word, which He has spoken, is speaking, and will continue to speak. To the, to the people, through us, in our hearts, in our minds as well, to us, to remind us of who He is. We will be ready when Jesus returns, if we remain in Him. We remain in Him every day, remaining in that truth, because we know the truth, we understand the truth, we recognize the lies, and if we continue to do that, and listening to Him, what's going to happen is, is that we will be ready when He returns. Until then, we labor. We labor by serving Him. With everything that we have, we serve Him and we serve one another with using the gifts, using the talents, and all the skills that He has given to us. We are secure in Christ. Remain in Him through your faith. Remain in Him. And there is just nothing the enemy can do. Oh, he can make life hard, but he can't steal you away because the work of Christ is secure. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I do thank you that there is evil in the world and that you've let us know about it. You make us aware that evil is there and, Lord, you have done something about it. I know sometimes we question and think, well, what has God done about this? Lord, I admit... You have done something. You sent your son, Jesus. You sent your truth into the world. You sent your word who became flesh into this world. He is the truth. Living and breathing. And Father, I pray that we would listen to your voice. Listen to him. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to you. Because we know the truth. We have an anointing from you. Because of that, we can recognize the lies and stand against them and expose them with your truth. Help us, Lord, to remain in you, to take the stand against the devil's schemes, but to focus upon what we have in you, not what the devil is doing, but to focus on you because when we do, what the devil is doing will be exposed and those who are serving the devil's purposes will flee from the church. Help us, Father, to fix our thoughts, our eyes, and our hearts upon you and your word, your truth, your way, and the life that you give us. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.